The natural world, a vast web of life unfolding across the ages. You've seen it displayed in museums, fossils frozen in time, wild creatures preserved in glass cases, snapshots of nature untouched. Then came us, humans with boundless creativity, relentless curiosity, and a habit of reshaping everything we touch. As a result, today we live in a world filled with living organisms not just shaped by nature, but also by human intention, design, and technology. We're about to explore the blurred lines between the natural and the man-made, and uncover the strange, fascinating world of organisms shaped by human hands. Most of us have been to natural history museums, or at least heard of them, but have you ever heard of a post-natural history museum? Well, today we are in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania at the Center for Post-Natural History. We call it the Center for Post-Natural History, uh, and, but it is a museum. It's the only museum of its kind in the whole world. Uh, we specialize in living things that have been altered by people on purpose. So that's like domesticated things, but also genetically engineered things. We really focus on the things that we can say, we meant to do that. That's human culture right there, you know? And then you can talk about it the same way you talk about architecture and art and sports, you know, all the other things that we do on purpose. This display here is in time order, so it started with captivity? Yeah, this is, yes. This is the language I've come up with to try to describe what I see as the stages of post-natural history, that it begins first with captivity. That's the, the dog leash. That's the fence around the farm. It's where you're separating the wilds from the garden, right? After that, you start to pick your favorites, right? And that's when you're involved in breeding and they're deciding you know, like who's matched with who and who's out and all that kind of stuff. And that's where things really speed up. That's where you get all your wild diversity of dogs and chickens and- Giant pumpkins. And giant pumpkins and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, and then eventually you reach a limit where like there's only so much you can do the old fashioned way. And that's where genetic engineering and all these new technologies of transgenics and synthetic biology, where you are essentially breaking the built-in constraints on breeding and you enter this realm of engineering. The proverbial elephant in the room uh, is freckles. Freckles is a genetically modified goat, uh, a Sanin breed, but she's unlike every other Sanin that came before her in that she has a gene that makes her make spider silk in her milk. She's one of the first four goats that were genetically engineered to produce spider silk. And I suspect she's probably different from all the goats that are kind of going to come after her because I don't, I don't think spider silk is going to be made in goats necessarily. And what is spider silk? Yeah, so spider silk is like, it's a textile. It's super strong, yet it's flexible. So stronger than steel at that scale. You make a real thin but um, it's, you know, body armor, cable, like kind of like utilitarian stuff like that. They tried to make textile fabrics out of it, but um, it really doesn't feel very good. This is fascinating to me. So like the whole history of audio that we think of starting with like, you know, Thomas Edison really starts with birds, with well-trained canaries. People would train birds. Um, they even developed machines that would play a melody over and over again to program the birds and then sell them in a well-trained canary sells for a lot more money. So yeah, they were they were bred for capacity to learn melodies that sound good to us because it's not they're not singing the ones that sound good to the birds. We're not training them for that. We're turning it into something that fits human aesthetics. So yeah, there's a lot of post-natural history that's driven by aesthetics. Genetically modified flowers that come in colors that don't naturally occur in those species. The mice and rats that we use in the laboratory that we think of as these like snowball you know, white mice, white rat. Before they arrived in the lab, there was a whole culture of fancy rat and mouse breeders that they come from. So they were bred for aesthetic purposes long before they were bred for scientific purposes. There's so many different kinds of chickens in this world, right? And they're all domesticated. They're all different. Most of that is aesthetics. Is there a specific governing body who decides what is okay, what's not okay? Are labs writing to get permission? And on the other end of the scale, aside from science, certain dogs are still, or at least have been bred in a certain way for certain traits, like you were saying. So who gets to decide what's okay? Who gets okay? to decide? It's super complicated and, and unclear, and it varies from country to country, state to state sometimes, institution to institution. And it matters at what point in the life cycle of the animal we're talking about. There's things you can do in the egg that you can't do after 
afterwards, right? Something I did not know until I was researching for this video is that flu vaccines are developed inside eggs. Did you know this? I guess they sometimes ask if you have an egg allergy before getting a flu vaccine because it's made inside eggs. Did you ever have sea monkeys when you were little? So how do they, they're just freeze dried? They are brine shrimp and brine shrimp have this capacity to go into like a hard little, almost like a seed state. Um, so when a, when a lake dries out and there's no more water, they can like weather that for years until the next rain comes. It's called cryptobiosis. So the, the creator of sea monkeys just sort of hijacked that capacity and figured out how to make it work in a little packet um, so that he could sell it to kids. I guess that goes along with my question of if I want to start a business where I make the most the best smelling rose, am I allowed to selectively breed roses to get the best smelling? Yes, only if you're involved in genetic engineering, like taking a gene from a non-rose and putting it into your roses, then, then you're gonna run into some regulations. But yeah, the old fashioned way. Totally. Do it, do, yeah, do what you will. So as a center, do you keep track of all of the new things that are happening or is this happening on such a wide scale these days? It's too big now. I mean, I try to, like I read my science magazines, I read the news every day, but um, yeah, there's so much going on. What is the trend looking like? Is it more you see this sort of thing in science and labs? Yeah, so the lab part of it is huge, right? That's like the, the explosion of diversity is when you have, um, you know, one kind of inbred mouse that is suddenly in like 50,000 different varieties, right? And each one has one little gene that's tweaked in some other way. And that's really hard to see because we don't, we don't see those lab animals, right? They happen in, inside buildings. So this is one place where we try to at least present a vista of what's going on. And so the museum itself is not taking a stance one way or the other. In, in an effort to have a place where like everybody can just kind of try to wrap their head around what the heck is going on, um, yeah, we, 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 we try not to weigh in and we let you do that. And everybody that comes in the store and leaves, they have a different set of questions, every single person. Do you ever find people who are ethically opposed to this sort of thing? Not Certainly. that the museum is the one doing it, but... Right. Absolutely, absolutely. Animal rights activists and all kinds of people come in here, but they find different things to talk about. And I think that's the power of this place is like it does, you know, there's some things that are familiar and there's some things that are unfamiliar. And because we're not telling you what to think one way or another, you have the rare opportunity to change your mind. Um, and that's kind of what we're here for. And I almost don't care which, how you change your mind. It's just as long as you're different. That was a fascinating place. I had never thought about this, but now that I know of a post-natural history museum, it's unusual that there aren't more of these places given that so much of our modern life is filled with these sorts of things. I guess it's become so normal we don't really think about it, but it's pretty refreshing to see when people like Rich Pell open things like this, which present us the opportunity to contemplate the world around us. Thank you all for joining me. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up, hit subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you next time.